In the last video, we considered some elementary flows and looked at their properties, their complex potential functions, velocity components, and, and we said that we can combine those in useful ways to get some more interesting flows. And that's exactly what we're going to do here, is we're going to superimpose some of these basic flows in order to get uh, useful flows, like flow around a circular cylinder is what we'll look at in this video. Now the basis for this is, we, is superposition. The governing equations are linear, it's Laplace's equation, linear PDE. So we can superimpose different solutions to get a new solution. So we can simply take the sum of various complex potential functions and get a new complex potential function, which then represents a different flow. So let's consider the flow past a circular cylinder. This is a classic problem in fluid mechanics. We've been looking at it analytically, numerically, experimentally for many, many years, for well over 100 years, in fact. And we'll look at the potential flow solution for this classical problem. So the way you get a flow around a circular cylinder is you superimpose a uniform flow, where in this case we'll have alpha is equal to zero, so it's just gonna be a, a parallel horizontal uniform flow, and actually a doublet. So the doublet plus the uniform flow is going to give us the flow around a circular cylinder. And let's just walk through those details. So here's the capital phi, the complex potential function. It's the uniform flow with alpha is zero, so that's u times z, plus the doublet, s over z. As always, we can use x plus i, y, or we can use r e to the i theta for z. Because it's a cylindrical geometry, we'll use cylindrical coordinates or polar coordinates. So z I'm gonna represent as r e to the i theta. One over z is one over r e to the i theta. From the Euler formula, e to the i theta is cosine theta plus i sine theta. e to the minus i theta is cosine theta minus sine sine theta. Collect the real parts together and collect the imaginary parts together. This is real, this is real, this is imaginary, and this is imaginary. So this becomes our little phi, our velocity potential, and this becomes an expression for our string function, psi. So you see those here, phi and psi. Now, the question we have to answer is, where is the circular cylinder, right? So how do I know that this really is the flow around a circular cylinder? Remember what we said in the last video, any streamline in a potential flow problem because the flow is inviscid could be regarded as a solid surface. So I can look at the streamlines and if I can find one that's circular, an exact circle, then I can regard that as the surface, that's my cylinder, and then I have the flow around the cylinder. Turns out we'll also have the flow, quote unquote, inside the cylinder. We actually don't care about that, but that has to be included in order to get the flow around the, the cylinder. So let's see how that works. So let's say we have a cylinder of radius capital R that's equal to the square root of S over U. And you say, well, how do you know that? Well, yeah, I, I kind of peeked at the end of the book. All right, so let's substitute in for little r, here, 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 and here. Let's put in capital R. So capital U times R minus S over R, all times sine theta. But then let's substitute for R, capital S over U. Remember, S is the strength of the doublet capital U is the uniform flow. So we have capital U times the square root of S over U minus S times the square root of U over S because it's one over R. Well, a square root of U cancels here, a square root of S cancels here, and you have the square root of S times U minus the square root of S times U, so that's just equal to zero. So on a circular cylinder of radius capital R, which is equal to the square root of S over U, that has a value of stream function which is zero. Now it's actually not important that the value be zero, it just has to be a constant. It happens to be zero in this case, but that's immaterial. So as long as we have a stream line where stream function is equal to a constant in the shape that we want, in this case a circular cylinder, then we can regard this as the flow around that circular cylinder. So here are the streamlines I've plotted here. You'll notice here is that psi is equal to zero streamline, and it's a perfect circle centered at the origin. You can see the doublet that is throwing fluid out to the left and sucking it back to the right. And then you have the uniform flow coming in from the left and passing around the cylinder. So that's the, those are the streamlines. Uh, and you can put little arrows on them if you'd like that show the directions of the, the flow. So one thing you'll notice about this is if you look at the origin, what's going on? We have this one over z, right? So when z goes to zero, that blows up. So you actually have a singularity at the center of your doublet. But that's okay because this portion of the domain, 
while we need it mathematically in order to get the flow around the circular cylinder, we actually don't care physically. So whatever goes on in there mathematically has no consequence for what goes on physically for the flow around the cylinder on the outside, like so. Okay, so let's get the velocity components. As we've said before, there's three ways to get these. Uh, let's do it using all three ways in this case. So here it is from the velocity potential, so that's little phi. So vr is partial phi partial r. That's the definition of the, of the velocity potential. And so if you differentiate the phi that we just got, with respect to r, you get this expression here. That's vr. If you do the similar thing for v theta, that's 1 over r partial phi partial theta. Again, here's 1 over r, and then minus this. That's the partial phi partial theta. Simplify it a little bit, and you get this expression. Now I'll go through these kind of fast because they're all the same. Same idea for the stream function. So now you use the expression that we just obtained for psi, which is the imaginary part of capital phi. And vr can be written in terms of that, v theta in terms of psi. And you get the same expressions for vr and v theta. So the third way would be to use the complex conjugate of the complex velocity, which again is just d phi dz. So here's the complex potential function, u z plus s over z. Differentiate that with respect to z, and you just get u minus s over z squared. Write z in terms of r e to the i theta. Now remember what we said in the last video, when we're using polar coordinates, and you're extracting out the velocity components from the complex conjugate of the complex velocity, you have to remember that there's this e to the minus i theta factor. So I don't have an e to the minus i theta factor in both terms. So what I'm going to do is multiply and divide by it. So I'm not changing the result. But now I'm going to keep this all, all highlighted in red so you can see it just kind of coming along for the ride. And we just have to remember to take that out when we extract the real and imaginary parts then. So then I have e to the i theta times this u minus s over r squared e to the minus 2 i theta. So bring in the e to the i theta into both terms. Use the Euler formula as before. And then collect the real and imaginary parts. And then neglecting the e to the minus i theta. This is u vr. And this is v theta which again is the same thing as we obtain using the other two methods. So just to illustrate, any one of the three methods is fine. You get the same result either of those three methods. So now let's consider this flow a little bit further. Let's take a look at, for example, what is the radial velocity, vr, on the surface of the cylinder? So when little r is equal to big R, what is the value of that radial velocity? Well, here's the general expression for vr. It's u minus s over little r squared times cosine theta. But let's substitute for little r, big R. But big R is the square root of s over u. So if I substitute that in and simplify it, you see the s's cancel. And I have 1 over 1 over u, so that's just u. u minus u is 0. So I get 0. And you just ask yourself, does that make sense? So this is the flow around a circular cylinder. And we have a streamline in a circular shape. And what this is saying is right at that surface, there is no radial velocity of the fluid. So there's no fluid crossing that streamline, which is exactly what we expect. Because remember, the streamlines are everywhere tangent to the velocity vector. So there's no flow across a streamline. So that confirms that. Now let's look at v theta. So this is the velocity, we call it the slip velocity, of the fluid as it passes over the surface and under the surface of the cylinder, but right at the surface. So again, take the general expression for v theta, put in little r is big R, and big R is square root of s over u, and we find that that's equal to minus 2 cap u sine theta. So remember, capital U, that's the incoming velocity of the uniform flow. So what this is saying is, as you pass over and under the cylinder, a point at the very top or bottom, when theta is pi over 2, for example, well, sine pi over 2, that's just 1. So the velocity is minus 2u. So the velocity is just twice that of the uniform flow coming in. So that's interesting. So as the flow comes in, it hits the cylinder, has to go around it above or below. It has to accelerate to do so because of conservation of mass and the velocity right at the top and right at the bottom of the cylinder, actually twice that of the uniform velocity coming in. So we're getting all this straight from the potential flow solution couple remarks here. We could make the cylinder rotate. 
by taking a uniform flow plus a doublet plus a point vortex and that would cause the cylinder to rotate and we could actually get lift on uh, that rotating cylinder. We can also use images of various features. So for example, if we wanted to model a feature such as a vortex above a plane surface, so you think, well, a plane surface, that means I need to get a streamline that corresponds, say, to the real axis, a straight line. That, that'll be my surface. So we can do that by taking a vortex plus its image, so a point vortex above and a point vortex below. So same height, say H, above and below. And then you get a symmetry line. This symmetry line is a streamline, and that could be regarded as our surface. And I've hashed this out because I actually don't care about what's going on in the surface, just like I don't really care about what's going on inside the circular cylinder. But I need that flow below the real axis in order to get the flow that I want, which is the point vortex above the surface. So we can do uh, tricks like that in order to get more interesting flows as well. We can get any airfoil shape we'd like by combining sources and sinks and point vortices into various geometric combinations and different strengths. So I can uh, just take that circular cylinder, which only had one doublet in it, and I can add additional features, sources and sinks and point vortices, and I can change the shape of that into any airfoil shape that I would like.